We're going to do a lot of reading tonight, and then we will get to the things that God has said on the subject of abortion. According to the Gutmarker Institute, there are 1.21 million abortions performed in the United States there were in 2008. That is the most recent year for which data is available. And that amounts to 3,322 abortions per day. That's compared to, if you would, all of the casualties of World War I and II, the Civil War, Vietnam War, Korean War, the Revolutionary War, the War on Terror, the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, and the Northwest Indian War, all of those casualties combined equal 657,562. And we abort 1.21 million per year. From 1973, it's estimated that there have been 50 million abortions in this country. But what is abortion? If you define the word abortion, you will come, with, you'll come up with this definition or one very much like it. Abortion is defined as the deliberate termination of a human pregnancy, most often performed during the first 28 weeks of pregnancy. Merriam-Webster's, the medical definition says, the termination of pregnancy after, accompanied by, resulting in, or closely followed by the death of the embryo or fetus. The definition for pregnant, according to Merriam-Webster, is containing a developing embryo or fetus or unborn offspring within the body. Well, what's an embryo? The definition of an embryo includes the developing human, the developing human individual from the time of implantation to the end of the eighth week after conception. It suggests that we compare that to a fetus. The fetus, according to definition, is a developing human from usually two months after conception to birth. Commences at the beginning of the ninth week is the suggestion or the definition. What is conception? According to Merriam-Webster, conception means the process of becoming pregnant, involving fertilization or implantation or both. Google says it is the action of conceiving a child or of a child being conceived, an unfertilized egg before conception. The Free Dictionary says it's the formation of a viable zygote by the union of the male sperm and the female ovum, or fertilization. The entity formed by the union of the male sperm and the female ovum, an embryo, or zygote, or zygote. What happens and how does this relate or what is involved in one becoming pregnant? According to WebMD, regarding pregnancy and conception, the WebMD says most of the time you won't know the exact day when you got pregnant. Your doctor will count the start of your pregnancy from the first day of your last menstrual period. That's about two weeks ahead of when conception actually occurs. Now what happens? Well, each month inside your ovaries, a group of eggs starts to grow in a small fluid-filled sacs called follicles. Eventually, one of the eggs erupts from the follicle, ovulation. It usually happens about two weeks before your next period. After the egg leaves the follicle, the follicle develops into something called the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum releases a hormone that helps thicken the lining of your uterus, getting it ready for the egg. After the egg is released, it moves into the fallopian tube. It stays there for about 24 hours for a single sperm to fertilize it. All this happens on average about two weeks after your last period. If no sperm is around to fertilize the egg, it moves through the uterus and disintegrates. Your hormone levels go back to normal. Your body sheds the thick lining of the uterus, and your period starts. If one sperm does make its way into the fallopian tube and burrow into the egg. It fertilizes the egg. The egg changes so that no other sperm can get in. At the instant of fertilization, your baby's genes and sex are set. If the sperm has a Y chromosome, your baby will be a boy. If it has an X chromosome, the baby will be a girl. 
The egg stays in the fallopian tube for about three to four days, but within 24 hours of being fertilized, it starts dividing very fast into many cells. It keeps dividing as it moves slowly through the fallopian tube to the uterus. Its next job is to attach to the lining of the uterus. This is called implantation. Implantation is the attachment of the fertilized egg when the fertilized egg, now called a blastocyst, has completed its travel through the fallopian tube and adheres to the lining of the uterus. Implantation happens about a week after ovulation with a range of 6 to 12 days after fertilization. Some women notice spotting or slight bleeding for one or two days around the time of implantation. The lining of the uterus gets thicker and the cervix is sealed by a plug of mucus. It will stay in place until the baby is ready to be born. Within three weeks, the cells begin to grow as clumps and the baby's first nerve cells have already formed. Now, it's been a while since I read the definition, so let me one more time. What is the definition of an abortion? It is the deliberate termination of a human pregnancy. What you just heard read is how one becomes pregnant. And what we're going to do now is deliberately terminate that. How do we do that? There are several methods of abortion. One is called suction abortion. Suction abortion is used during the first three months of pregnancy. A suction tube, estimated 27 times stronger than a home vacuum cleaner, is inserted into the womb. The powerful suction tears the baby apart limb from limb and sucks it from the womb along with the placenta. The baby's remains are deposited into an attached waste bottle. Another way is dilation and cutterage, or DNC. It is used at the end of the third month of pregnancy, approximately 12 weeks. The cervix is dilated, ring forceps are inserted into the womb, and the baby is extracted piece by piece. Then a curette, a sharp knife in a loop shape, is inserted and used to scrape away any of the baby or the placenta that remains, profuse bleeding follows. Then there is dilation and extraction, or D and E. And this is used after 13 weeks. The cervix is dilated and the unborn child is dismembered with plier-like forceps. Force is needed to pull the baby apart. The instrument is used to seize a leg or other part of the body and then with a twisting motion, tear it from the baby's body. The baby's spine is snapped and the skull is crushed. After the baby parts are removed, they are reassembled outside of the womb to be sure all are removed. Frequently, baby parts are left inside the mother's womb. This can cause serious complications and sometimes death. That brings us to another uh, way of aborting a baby, and that is what's called partial birth abortion. Now, before I read you that, part of the ruling of the Supreme Court, part of what they had to do once they started down this path is to find out when the state would have a vested interest in the child's life. When can the state step in and begin to protect the child? And so they invented the trimester period. And they said at some point the baby will become or the fetus will become viable. So let me read you their definition of what's involved in that, and then we'll return to this partial birth abortion. The final stage of pregnancy under Roe v. Wade occurs after the fetus becomes viable. After viability, the state could regulate or prohibit abortions unless they were necessary in appropriate medical judgment. Now, what does that mean? Uh, to preserve the life or health of the woman. You, you'll want to note that because it's important. Uh, the state could intervene if there was a necessary, um, unless there was an appropriate medical judgment to preserve life or health of the woman. Now, what, what does that mean? Here's the standard they, they, they used for the health of the woman. The standard is, it may be uh, in, the, in the decision of Doe versus Bolton, the clinical judgment may be exercised in light of all factors. The factors include physical, emotional, psychological, familial, and the woman's age. All of those things can be used 
to say the state has no vested interest. It's not viable. If the woman's health is in jeopardy, what's her health? Her physical health, her emotional health, her psychological health, her familial health, and her age. As the patient deems it, those factors could and would prevent the state from stepping in. Say all that so that you understand when we talk partial birth abortions, these babies are certainly, by even the state's definitions or the government's definitions, viable. But with this definition of health, really what you can do is abort a baby from conception up to nine months. It's pretty much what we have in partial birth abortions. Let me read to you how this works. Partial birth abortions are used from the fourth month and through the end of the ninth month of pregnancy. These late-term abortions are regularly used to kill healthy babies that pose no danger or threat to their mother. For this abortion, the abortionist uses ultrasound to locate the unborn baby's legs. Forceps are then used to pull the baby's legs through the birth canal, delivering the baby feet first, except for the head. Scissors are then used to puncture the base of the back of the head. A suction device is then inserted to suction out the baby's brain so the skull will easily collapse. The dead baby is then removed. Now, the Mer American Medical Association Council on Legislation voted unanimously to recommend to the AMA Board of Trustees to endorse the ban on partial birth abortions. Former Surgeon General C. Everett Koop, along with hundreds of physicians and the Physicians Ad Hoc Coalition for Truth, said that this procedure is never necessary to save the life of the mother. Dr. Martin Haskell, an abortionist who specializes in these late-term abortions, has admitted to performing over a thousand of these abortions. He stated, in my particular case, probably 20% of these procedures are for genetic reasons. And people abort their babies if they have Downs or some other issue. But he says the other 80% are purely elective. That means in 80%, that is over 800 babies, there was no health risk for the mother and the baby had no handicaps. It's been documented that thousands of these abortions are performed each year. A New Jersey newspaper reported of the Bergen County record discovered and reported that 1,500 babies are killed each year by partial birth abortion at one New Jersey hospital alone. It is hard to exactly know how many of these abortions are performed each year, but we do know that the Centers for Disease Control reported there are over 17,000 abortions performed each year on babies older than four and a half months gestation. There are several other forms of abortion. One is a saline amniocentesis used after 16 weeks. A concentrated salt solution is injected with an am amniocentesis needle into the amniotic fluid. The baby breathes and swallows it and dies over an hour later of acute salt poisoning. The mother then delivers a dead burned baby. Use has declined because of the dangers of the mother and sometimes the baby survives. You can find children who have survived abortions. I saw a young lady as I was reviewing the material. She was and had been subject to one of these attempts and she had survived it. There is something called a prostaglandin. It's used for late term uh, abortions. A prostaglandin is injected into the amniotic sac causing premature labor and delivery of a dead baby. Intercardiac injections, poison is injected into the chest or heart of the fetus via a long needle inserted through the mother's abdomen. The dead baby is absorbed. Sometimes this results in the loss of all of the babies when using this method for pregnancy reduction. And then there are chemical abortions, the, the pill RU486. It takes place or ovulation occurs in 67 to 81% of the women who use these birth control pills. It's estimated that chemical contraceptives cause between 7 to 12 million abortions every year. It sounds bad, I know, but it gets worse because we've moved from abortion on demand, abortion in the womb, partially pulling the baby out and then killing the baby all the way to in your very state not many days ago. In fact, uh, I think it was in April. A woman from Planned Parenthood stood before your legislature discussing a bill they were hoping to pass 
that would require physicians in abortion settings to provide emergency medical care for the baby if the baby survived an abortion. And she was there defending that. And they asked her what should be done. If a baby survives an abortion and the baby is on the table and the baby is fighting for life, what should be done for the baby, they asked. Her reply was, I believe, we believe, that that decision should be left up to the mother and her physician. She said at one point in reference to the mother that they should be concerned for the patient, to which one of your legislatures asked her, isn't the baby the patient? She received a letter, or Planned Parenthood did, from Marsha Blackburn, a representative of Tennessee, Tennessee, wrote a scathing letter to Planned Parenthood in which she says this, I write to express my shock and concern regarding a Planned Parenthood lobbyist who recently advocated in support of post-birth abortion before a state legislature. Blackburn said in an April 3rd letter to Planned Parenthood, President Cecil Richards, it is my sincere hope that your national organization will fully repudiate the radical position and hold your lobbyists fully accountable. They received an apology and a letter and a statement. Uh, a statement from Planned Parenthood uh, read thusly, quote, last week, a panel of Florida state legislatures demanded speculation about a vague set of extremely unlikely and highly unusual medical circumstances. Medical guidelines and ethics already compel physicians facing life-threatening circumstances to respond, and Planned Parenthood physicians provide high-quality medical care and adhere to the most rigorous professional standards, including providing emergency care. In the extremely unlikely event that the scenario presented by the panel of legislators should happen, of course, Planned Parenthood will provide appropriate care to both the woman and the infant. The representative also asked several questions of Planned Parenthood. They were never answered. Those questions include these. At what point do you believe constitutional rights extend to American citizens if not at birth? If your organization does not believe birth is the deadline for protection against abortion, at what point, in your opinion, is a child's life deserving of legal protection? There were several other questions she asked, and I don't know that she ever got any good answer to any of those questions. Well, I think you and I should just know what's involved before we talk about what God has said about it, because there is so much misinformation on the subject. What has God said about it? There are five or six things we want to note from the scriptures, things that God has said about this subject or thing that God has said in general about life. And number one is this. God has said that life is sacred. That's God's position. Life is sacred because God made man in his image. Genesis 1, 26, 27, the Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and, after, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Life is sacred because God made it. Secondly, life is sacred because God forms the spirit of man within him. Zechariah 12:1, Zechariah says, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. The Hebrew writers refers to God as the father of spirits. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 9. Furthermore, he says, we have had our fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? The baby has a spirit in the womb. God says to Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the womb, listen to that, before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and I ordained thee to prophet unto the nations. David's words in Psalm 139, beginning in verse 12, speak to that end. 
David says, yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Take the time, if you would, to watch the growth of a baby through animation. Watch it on video. Watch it in steals. Watch the fearfully, wonderfully work, wonderful work of God. David says, marvelous are thy works, and thy, that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest part of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which is in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Life is sacred because human life is eternal. These babies have souls. These babies will live on eternally. Human life is sacred. That's God's position. The result of that is God's position is that human life is to be protected. As early as Genesis chapter 4, when Cain killed his brother Abel, verse 8 says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. It's almost eerie to think his blood crieth out from the ground. 1.2 million per year. 50 million since 1973. When the first one occurred, God confronted the assailant. Genesis chapter 4, you did wrong taking that life. God's position is that human life should be protected. So much so that in Genesis chapter 9, beginning in verse 4, the Bible says this. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood. By man shall his blood be shed. Why? For in the image of God made he man. God believes capital punishment should be meted out for murderers. That's his position. You shed blood, yours should be shed. That's God's position. He believes it should be protected. God commanded the unborn to be defended. Exodus 21 verses 22 and 23. If men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him. And he shall pay as the judge is determined. And if any mischief falleth, then thou shalt give life for life. God believes that human life should be protected. Thirdly, God expressly says he hates abortion. Proverbs chapter 6, beginning in verse 16, the proverb writer says, These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. 
heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among his brethren. These six things doth the Lord hate. Hands that shed innocent blood, and friends, babies are innocent. Romans chapter 9 and verse 11, as the Apostle Paul wrote about God's sovereignty and his his desire, his ability to make choices. He says this for the children, Jacob and Esau, for the children. Notice how he refers to them for the children being not yet born. Neither having done any good or evil. We have a word for that. Innocent. That the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. So innocent, our Lord thinks they are so innocent that his disciples should become like them. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3, Jesus said, And I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. God hates the shedding of innocent blood, and children are innocent, and their blood is being shed. God says that children in the womb and out of the womb are the same in his eyes. The same word is used to describe both. In the womb, the word is brephos. And Thayer says it is an unborn child, an embryo, a fetus, a newborn child, an infant, a babe. And you find that word used to describe babies in the womb and babies out of the womb. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 41, that word is used in this passage. The verse says, it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, verse 44 of that same chapter says, For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. The breathless leaped in my womb for joy. Where is the babe? In her womb. A chapter, more, a chapter later, Luke 2 and verse number 12. The Bible says, and this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe, breathless, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Verse 16, same chapter. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the breathless, the babe, lying in a manger. Friends, I submit to you the truth of the matter is, We all know better. We all know better than to kill our children and then argue for a right to do it. But we have made it a political debate. We coin phrases and cliches to call names and attack each other. Somebody invented pro-life. And in response, I suppose somebody invented pro-choice. This is one of those things that you'll forgive me. Uh, I just think that's dumb. I don't know how else to say that. Uh, Every person who is referred to as pro-life is pro-choice. They are. They want to choose where they eat, when they eat, what they wear, what they drive, where they live. They are very much pro-choice. But on the reverse side, every person who fancies him or herself pro-choice is pro-life. You don't believe me, just stand them in front of a firing squad and see if they're not pro-life. It's dumb because it reduces babies being killed to an argument over words. And it puts people in camps and suddenly you can throw arrows backwards and forwards and make the discussion about something the discussion is not. Changing names doesn't change the action. In my heart, I know we know that we shouldn't do this. We also know that because we've done this, we are terribly inconsistent. 
We charge individuals with murder who kill the child of a pregnant woman. We will charge that person with double murder. Our positions on this is indefensible and sad. And it shows our utter contempt for the sanctity of life. When reaching the, the researching the information, I Googled, why was Scott Peterson charged with double murder? Went and read a bunch of articles and went to one of the, the sites where people began to give their, their, their version of what they think to the, to the answer. These are two of the answers, and this will give you some insight into what people are thinking. One person said, if, listen, brace yourself. They actually said this. I, I'm not making this up. This is what they said. If the mother wanted to have the kid, then it was going to be a person. And it's therefore a double murder. Same person. If the woman is unwilling to bear the child to term, the fetus is never going to be a person. And therefore, it's not a murder. They went on. Yes, it's a fetus. No, it's not a person. If it were a person, it would have a favorite cup, uh, color or animal or any aspects of a personality at all. If it doesn't, it is as inhumane as a rat. Another person says this. Only the woman in whom the fetus is growing. I, I, I need to, let me just stop there long enough to, to, to tell you again, brace yourself. Only the woman in whom the fetus is growing has the right to kill the fetus. It's inside her, altering her body, connected to her blood supply, etc. It's her life that will be endangered by labor and delivery. Pregnancy is dangerous for a woman. For this reason, abortion should always be legal. Scott Peterson's life was not in danger from the fetus, and that's why he was charged with murdering it. Is that our defense? Am I to understand that correctly, that when a person gets pregnant, the, 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 what's growing inside of her is a human if she says it's a human is a baby if she says it's a baby. If she doesn't deem it's a baby, if she doesn't deem it's human, then only she has the right to kill the baby. You know, several years ago, there was a woman who took her two children, drove them to a body of water, drowned them, blamed it on some indescript man, was later found out, found the babies. I believe they were as early as two, maybe younger, about that age. She was arrested. She was charged with murder. I remember reading an article by a gospel preacher or somebody in the Lord's church, and I, don't, I, I know the person did not mean to be uh, callous or, or cold in any way, I know that. But the article said something to the effect that her only problem was they were outside of her body. Had she decided months earlier, eight months, nine months, to kill those same children, 
She would have had a slew of people defending her right to do it. But because she drowned them outside of her body, she was arrested and shot. The inconsistency of that is indefensible. Abortion is a problem. There's no doubt about that. But I'd like to back up a little bit further before we get there. And that is this. We have forsaken God before we get to abortion. The psalmist says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, Psalm 100. All ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. Listen to it. It is he that made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endure to all generations. We devalue human life because we have devalued God. The ground before God is still holy. Friends, we shouldn't simply take off our shoes. We should take off our inordinate pride and prostrate ourselves before him. That's how we get to abortion. We should humble ourselves before our God. We should return to God for his mercy endureth forever. The proverb writer encourages what should be encouraged to every person in the world. Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. The problem arises when we violate things that God has said. Let us not look upon a woman to lust after her. You know, if there were no fornication, there'd be no unwanted pregnancies. But fornication, Paul says, let it not once be a name among us as become its saints, Ephesians 5, 3. Let us not be conformed to the world, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, verse 2. Friends, you do appreciate that most of these words are made up. You do appreciate that when you turn on your television and listen to people talk about these matters, that they aren't speaking about it from a biblical standpoint. Let each of us have his own wife and husbands have, uh, wives have their own husbands, 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5. And then we wouldn't have the problems that we have. Let us hold that a soul, just one soul, it's so precious that our Lord said it is worth the whole world. Matthew 16, 26. For what is a man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And then what if we, what if we didn't use the names that they told us to use? What if we didn't just regurgitate what we heard on the television? What if we didn't just align ourselves with the people we like and the positions that we like? What if, what if we just called it what it is? Abortion is murder. Does a woman have a right to murder another human being ever? If you look up the word murder, this is the definition. It is the unlawful premeditated killing of one human being by another. Do you remember the definition of abortion? The deliberate termination of a human pregnancy, most often performed during the first 28 weeks of pregnancy. 
the unlawful premeditated killing of one human being by another, the deliberate termination of a human pregnancy. Friends, you tell me, what's that? If it's not murder. I tried, and I told David I would. I said, I'll try to keep my emotions intact so I don't get all over the place. But I suppose we also need to tell murderers that they can be forgiven. They can. And we should teach that, and we should pray for that. Oh, I don't know who has or has not had an abortion. I don't know who has or who knows somebody else who has. I don't know. I know this. It's sin, and sin can be forgiven. But human life is sacred, in and out of the womb. Human life is valuable. One soul is worth the whole world. Human life is eternal. God forms the spirit of man within him, and that soul will live forever. The state can make it legal, but it violates God's law. And all men... Friends, hear me on this one. All human beings, including Supreme Court justices, will stand before the judge of all the earth and give an account for themselves. God has spoken about abortion. Friends, I hope for your soul that you are speaking the same thing. As I was reading this, I came across this... uh, This letter that was written by, or this poem written by Martin Niemalter. He was an outspoken foe of Adolf Hitler, spent the last seven years of the Nazi campaign in a concentration camp, and he wrote these words. He said, first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak up because I was not a socialist. He said, then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak up because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak up because I was not a Jew. And then he said, they came for me, and there was no one left to speak up for me. Friends, please don't politicize this. Babies are being killed. And the same people who now talk about viability, suppose they start talking about senior citizens not being viable. They'll use the same language. They'll say it's unwanted and it's a burden and they're not giving as much as they're taking. And at some point, somebody might come for you. You might ask yourself, and I would encourage you to research a lady by the name of Margaret Sanger. And I would encourage you to investigate something called eugenics. According to her, the person standing before you, they ought to come for. Because he's not a good birth, according to eugenics. Friends, you and I don't speak up. They will in time prevent them from coming from us. God has spoken about abortion. I pray we speak the exact same thing. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we praise you, and Father, we adore you. We thank you for your loving kindness and for your tender mercy. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Father, for your love. And most of all, we thank you for giving us your Son, our Lord and our Savior, the Christ. Father, we thank you for making us free. And it is just that freedom that has allowed so much in our country and in our lives, Father, to be so contrary to you and to your will. We pray for Supreme Court justices. We pray for presidents. We pray for those who represent this nation. We pray for every person making decisions that impact the world and impact souls. And Father, we pray for us as an individual, as well as a congregation, as well as a nation, that, Father, we'll turn our attention back to you, and that we will have a respect, a high regard for human life, the sanctity and the souls of men, that ultimately, Father, souls might have a home with you in heaven. Please forgive us when we fail you. Please help us to shine your light in this world, and may you be glorified through us. In Jesus' name, amen.